If you would like our free newsletters on various religious topics, just send us an email at cdebater at aol.com and free newsletters will be sent to you by mail. Just provide your postal address in your email. The following are samples of some of the newsletters we have available. Does God Believe in Atheists? Part 1 Seventh-day Adventism, True or False? The Agony of Deceit The Origins of Muhammad's Religion Spiritual Warfare Are Psychic Mediums Communicating with Ghosts or Demonic Spirits? Testimony to the Eternal Godhead, the Trinity. From Tradition to Truth, a Priest's Story. An Evaluation of the Oneness Pentecostal Movement. Mormonism, Counterfeit Christianity. Turn or Burn. Jehovah's Witnesses, Deceived Deceivers. Links to these newsletters can also be found at our website www.biblequery.org Once on the home page, simply click on the menu icon at the upper left hand corner. Then click on the newsletters button. Feel free to print them out. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. the destruction of the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. The Assyrians conquered and destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel in about 722 BC, about 2700 years ago. The Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem in 586 BC, about 2600 years ago. Jerusalem and the temple were later rebuilt but were destroyed again this time by the Romans in 70 A.D. In 135 A.D., the Romans again attacked and destroyed Jerusalem. Why are the Jews and their nation states and temples always eventually getting destroyed in centuries past? Luke chapter 19, 41 through 44. Jesus explained why Jerusalem would be destroyed. Luke 21, verses 23 and 24. Jesus said Jerusalem will be trampled upon. Matthew 24, 1 and 2. Jesus prophesied that the temple would be destroyed. Matthew 15, verses 3 through 9. Jesus condemns the Jewish religious leaders, saying they have replaced the commandments of God with the traditions of men. The Old Testament prophets, such as Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Habakkuk, and others, foretold of the destruction of Israel or Judah for their sins against the God of Israel. Even the law of Moses outlines the curses that will come upon the Jews if they disobey and rebel against God's laws and statutes. See Deuteronomy chapter 28 verses 15 through 68. Notice how, how many verses that is. That's a lot of verses of curses. In 2 Kings chapter 17, verses 33, 34, 35, and 41, it sums up one of the main reasons for God bringing down destructive judgment on the Jews. Quote, They feared the Lord and served their own gods according to the custom of the nations from among whom they had been carried away into exile. To this day, they do according to the earlier customs, they do not fear the Lord, nor do they follow their statutes or their ordinances or the law 
or the commandments which the Lord commanded the sons of Jacob, whom he named Israel, with whom the Lord made a covenant and commanded them, saying, quote, You shall not fear other gods, nor bow down yourselves to them, nor serve them, nor sacrifice to them. So while these nations feared the Lord, they also served their idols, their children likewise, and their grandchildren, as their fathers did, so they do to this day. So a big problem here was syncretism, combining the exclusive God of Israel with all these phony fake gods and idols from the pagan nations around them. Since the Jews refused to repent, Israel and then Judah were destroyed by pagan invaders. He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. That comes from Proverbs 29.1. As we shall see by studying the teachings of the Jewish Babylonian Talmud, the Jewish leaders still repeat the same errors they have committed throughout the past as recorded in the Bible. Greetings and welcome once again to our program. I'm Larry Wessels, your host, and I want to thank you for joining us for another edition of Christian Answers Presents. And I'm here in studio with one of my favorite guests for this program, Rob Zins. Rob, great to have you here again, brother. Thank you, Larry. Good to yeah. be here again. Yeah, you're one of you. our, our regulars, and you got a lot of fans out there who have probably subscribed to our channel only because of you. <laughs> they want to see more of that, you. But, they want to uh, see more of you. So uh, that's the beauty of it. And uh, you're one of my favorite guests, that's for sure. And uh, the, the Lord, I think, is just really blessed you in your ministry, the way you preach, your, your meekness uh, as you deal with difficult subjects that, uh, in, a, in, a, in kind of an inoffensive way that, that uh, shows people that where your heart really is. It's, it's, it's for the love of God and for those uh, that are out there, I think they can see that love of God coming out of the way you preach and minister to people. I hope so. Now, uh, since I've introduced you here, I'd like you to just say a little bit about your background for those new viewers and people that don't already know you. Well, I seem to have done this once or twice with you before, right? I don't know how many videos we have up on uh, YouTube, but we have a good I don't know. It must be seven or 80 videos by now. Okay. Now, so. Here's the interesting thing, and I ought to mention this right now, I guess. Uh, I first met you, and we did our first video together in 1990. Oh. Now, see, that's, that's almost long, 30 years ago, not quite, at the time of this, this video. Mm -hmm. Almost 30 years ago. I really don't like to give away dates and times because I like our videos pretty much. I don't say who the president is, you know, because who knows, someone 50 years from now might be watching this, you know. But, but the, the interesting thing here is, as we film this broadcast today, uh, we've been doing it for almost 30 years now. And so I want people at home to take a quick memory lane uh, look at some of these video clips from some previous shows. In fact, the very first show you and I did together back in 1990 at the old Austin Cablevision studio. At that time, it was held at the Time Warner Cable Studio. There was only... Uh, we were just doing cable access back then. It wasn't internet like we're doing now. But uh, I was only one of uh, 12 cable access producers in the whole city of Austin that got to use that multi-million dollar studio. And what was funny about that is that our studio time that we were allotted was on Saturdays from noon to 6. And we followed directly behind Madeline Murray O'Hare. Right. The most famous that. atheist at the time. Mm -hmm. So... Every, every month when we went in there to do our videos in that multi-million dollar television studio, uh, I got to see Madeline Murray O'Hare, the most famous uh, the atheist in the world maybe at that time, uh, giving me dirty looks. And so like, <laughs> That's a and compliment. All, her, all those atheist friends of hers who were going out as me and my Christian buddies were coming in to get the studio set up for stuff. But so anyway, that was a little memory lane stuff. But uh, folks at home, take a look at uh, some of these clips and this first clip you're going to see is Rob and me doing our very first video and we were dealing with the subject of uh, Roman Catholicism at that time we did a 16 part 
series on Roman Catholicism, and that was show number one back in 1990. I think we did eight episodes during 1990, and then in 1991, we did another eight episodes uh, when you came into town, because uh, Rob doesn't live here in uh, Austin, Texas. He's uh, from far away. I think it was in Rutland, Vermont back was, then. That's right. I that's, came down from Vermont to do those videos, and for those of you who are watching those early videos, it's really me. This is, <laughs> this is still me. Although things have changed a little bit, I'm sure. Now, think about the, it. that's exciting that God would give us this grace right. to be able All to do these, these kind of videos for almost 30 years in a row, and we're still going strong by God's grace. Right. I, I, I never stop praising Him for that, you right. know, for this, for all those things. So now what I want people to do is take a look at these clips of a young Rob Zins in our first uh, video ever done back in 1990. First is Old Testament Judaism. Okay, this is the way it was set up in the Old Testament under Jewish law and what had to take place under the way it was uh, organized at that time before Christ's coming. Okay, the second category here in the red is New Testament Christianity. What does the New Testament say about what Christianity is on different topics? And we'll go right down the line. And of course, the third topic here in the green is Roman Catholicism. And then what the Church of Rome says on key issues. And so what I'm going to bring out now is point number one, and we'll just go right down the list and analyze these things as we get a brief overview as to the differences as me and Robert are going to try to point out in this video series, between uh, Catholicism and New Testament Christianity. Okay, now we go over here, point number one. Under the Old Testament uh, Mosaic laws, you had what's called the high priest. And even in Jesus' day, you had Caiaphas was the high priest. He was kind of the head honcho. All the religious guys went to him, and uh, he was the overseer and went into the temple. To offer sacrifice you know, once a year and, and other uh, holy days. But when we come to the New Testament, we find that, according to the book of Hebrews, protect, I'm particularly thinking of Hebrews chapter 7, we find that the, our high priest now in the New Testament is Christ himself. Okay? And uh, I think the scriptures are, are pretty adamant about that. But when we go over here to Roman Catholicism, who do we find as the head honcho? As I was saying before about the high priest, and here the, our high priest now is Christ, but in Roman Catholicism, the vicar of Christ, the head of the church, the, the, the man that's in charge is the pope. I might interject at this point that in these first three, the Old Testament Judaism was an access religion. The way to God was through the priesthood. The access to God was through the priesthood. The New Testament religion, biblical Christianity, is direct access, not through, not through, not through, but right to Christ. Every believer and the body of believers form the cathedral or the temple of Christ. In the Romanistic religion, it's still very much an access religion. The only reason they have the Pope as the vicar of Christ on earth and then the priesthood and the main cathedral at Rome is because they still believe in an access system to God. I want to point out here uh, for, the, for the audience at home that the Roman Catholic religion has a number of foundational pillars the first foundational pillar, in my mind, is their understanding of the authority of the church to dispense salvation through the sacramental system. Very much like the Old Covenant, Old Testament, Pharisaical, Judaism system, where they built a hedge around the law of God to protect the law of God, and then drew their people into their own laws and misused and abused the law of God. Thus you have the New Testament counterpart to it, the sacramental system of the Roman Catholic Church. All this is designed to prove the point that, that the Catholic religion is founded on the idea that Christ came and left a system behind for us 
or you or anybody to go through in order to have a relationship with God. I just cannot emphasize this enough because Catholics believe we are saved by grace and faith. But their understanding of grace and faith is that grace comes through the system. It comes through the sacramental system. Well, there you go. There was Rob Zins in at the zenith of his young age. <laughs> uh, in fact, my, when I showed a picture of, to, you, uh, to my wife yesterday, because we did some videos yesterday, and uh, I showed her a picture of you now on my cell phone when I was, got home yesterday. And Rob, she's used to you, some of your older videos right, from a long time right. ago, and she looked at it, she go, Rob, Rob's got gray hair. <laughs> How did that happen? I didn't notice that. I do. <laughs> she, I think, so so I that's, the fun thing, that's the fun thing about uh, our videos on our YouTube channel, See Answers TV, in the sense that you can see us growing old over the years because we've got those, those videos that people just saw going back 29 years, 30 years, and then some uh, go back 20 years, some go back 10 years, and you can just see us getting old as we go You can't go along. hide it, so you might as well enjoy That's right. it. Right? In fact, speaking of getting old, today is my birthday, and uh, uh, I, I have hit 62 at this time. Oh. But I started doing uh, cable access TV back in 1985, so I've been doing Christian apologetic television since 1985, and to me, it's just gone by like, right. like nothing. Right. I mean, we were you and me are just flying up Jacob's ladder. <laughs> and well, we're not all the way up yet. We that's still right. We have a little bit of gas in the tank, and that's hopefully, right. we can do some good while we have amen, it. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And oh, by the way, speaking of, we're going to get into our main topic here in a minute. And I'm going to let you say a little bit more about. It. Although people from seeing those video clips of you already have a good idea of who you are from those other things, but. I thought this would be fun just to mention, as far as memory lane goes. Uh, some friends of mine back in 1984 put this together about me because I had a before television. I was doing uh, some some radio and things like that, and a lot of uh, neighborhood evangelism things like that. And they put this thing together. That's a picture of me. Do you know this man? He is a member of a small band of followers of Jesus Christ known as Dayspring Evangelism, better known as Cult Busters. <laughs> cult Busters. <laughs> Watch for him in your area soon. And of course, he's got this little thing marked out, and you got all, all of the Mormons, Baha'i page, Jehovah's Witnesses, Scientology, all uh, the different things that we've covered over all these decades. Well, you, know, you could use that, that today. You're still busting the cult. That's right. I think it's, uh, it's kind of cool. And, and one other thing I've got here as we lead into this is the very first newsletter we ever came out with uh, and this is from 1994. This is our very first. This is volume one, number one. And do you recognize the person on this cover of this, our first newsletter we ever did? It says his name is Rob Zins. No, that must be my really younger brother there. <laughs> is that him? Oh, that is. It's the same guy. <laughs> so, so anyway, since then, we've done a bunch of uh, newsletters, and uh, people can contact our ministry if they're like free copies of uh, these newsletters on a wide range of subjects. Mm -hmm. uh, divinely given faith really works. and I It, it really it, does. Yeah, that was true back in 1994 and it's still true, true today. today. So Absolutely. wonderful stuff. Yeah. Okay, now before I went into all this and interrupted you, you're about to tell our new viewers a little bit about yourself. Right, well, when Larry first asked me to come to do videos on the Roman Catholic religion. I was most pleased that somebody was interested in getting the truth of the Roman Catholic religion out into the public, and it was a great opportunity to have that access, and we've been doing it ever since. I still am the director of a Christian witness to Roman Catholicism. Our home base is in Charlotte, North Carolina, and uh, I've written... Mm, multitudes of articles, I guess you would say, I've written two books, several pamphlets, and uh, we have all this available on our website, cwrc-rz.org. If you go there and uh, take a look at our homepage and look to the left, you can click a button and it'll 
take you right to products we have that can help you understand the Roman Catholic religion. Is this one of those products? This is one of those products. Now, I'm holding in my hand the, this is the third edition of uh, Romanism. It's in Spanish, El Romanismo. Many of our products are in Spanish. And in fact, you can click on to our, one part of our website and you can hear an entire evangelistic presentation in Spanish to Roman Catholic people. We like to do this and make this sort of thing available. And if you don't have the money to buy tracks, in many cases, just let us know and we'll be able to send some stuff out to you. We have a vast amount of materials on our website site, and uh, I think you'll enjoy the articles as well. So we're up, we're still operating, we're still active. And I'll put in a plug for a big... Uh, conference that we're getting ready to put on in Springfield, Illinois, in the middle of May, May 17th through 19th. We'll have a number of guest speakers, and the whole thing will be devoted to the Protestant Reformation, the great solas of the Protestant Reformation, and it'll be sponsored by former Catholics for Jesus Christ. I think that uh, any of you who can come and enjoy that, we'd be more than welcome to have you. We do that sort of thing, and it's always posted on our website. We give good advance notifications. So still involved, still working, Amen. still vertical, as yes, yes. one lady said. But like I say, I can't stop praising God enough that we've been doing this for so many years. Right. It is a blessing. And we're still doing it. Still and doing it. There's so many that have fallen away or died or <laughs> retire or whatever, but we're still going. Well, That's... if you stay close to the Word of God, and if you stay on track with his revelation, his gospel, and continue to be faithful in Amen. that, then I think that uh, you're worthwhile. The minute you depart from that, yes. you might as well stop. Yes. And yes. if we ever do depart from that, we will stop. That's It'll it. be over. Yeah. Okay? Because you got to glorify God. That's your yeah. mission. Absolutely. And, and uh, the mission never stops until you're dead. As far as I'm concerned. Right. Sola fide and sola scriptura, brother. Amen. To the end. Amen. To the very to the end. end. Yeah. To the very end. Okay, now today's topic is going to be on the Jewish Talmud. Now, I've had a, a lot of people bug me over the years because our YouTube channel uh, has over 750 videos on it right now as we're doing this broadcast. Uh, you know, some people will be seeing this video years from now, but it might be a lot more by then. But uh, the thing is, at this moment, 750 videos done over the course uh, since 1985, as we're talking about. Of course, we haven't been on the Internet that long. The Internet came along later. Uh, but uh, the fact is, of all those hundreds of videos on so many topics and subjects, we've only got one video that's out there. Actually, it's a two-part of pretty much the same thing. It's, it's a, a comparative religions two-part series uh, where we have Judaism mixed in with uh, a lot of other religions and just go through the major tenets of those religions, like who's God, what's the way of salvation, you know, and you just kind of go down this list and you hit all these little highlights of all these different video, or, uh, religions at the same time. And that's really the sum total of everything we've got on Judaism. It's just, a, it's just mixed in with a bunch of other religions, and it's just it's kind of like in passing. Right, right. But this particular show, we're going to get into some detail, because I've had a lot of people want me to produce a show on Judaism okay. where people can get a better understanding of what that religion is up to, what it teaches, and how does it compare to the Scriptures, the Old Testament, New Testament, and... Uh, Go that way because that's usually our been our Christian apologetic approach all these years. Is you analyze the religion, you talk about what the religion teaches in contrast to what the Word of God, the Bible says. Right. So we're going to basically follow that same outline here. We just haven't done it much mm -hmm. with Judaism, and right. and then what's interesting to me is we've been trying to do this this particular video for like five years, <laughs> and, and, but one thing after another has happened where we were never able to get to it. And by finally, by the grace of God and His time and in providence, here we are. Here we are to do it. Here we are to do give it. it a try. All right. So now, uh, with that said, brother, go ahead and lead us into this topic, and we'll just see what we can find out. Okay. Right. Well, Larry, as you know, uh, the more you research and the more you study, the more you find out you don't know. So 
I've been looking at this material off and on for the last four years, and I find that I have file after file on it. So Why don't you hold it up for a second? Yeah, the stuff got, you're not even going to use. I've got all these files, <laughs> and I have all these files, and I have a book exclusively devoted to the Talmud, which okay. I'll introduce in just a minute. It's such a vast topic when you talk about the Hebrew yeah. Talmud, mm -hmm. but there's no place to start other than the beginning. So I'd like to just give an overview right. of what it is so our audience can understand yeah, what so, we're talking so the foundation about. Yeah, so foundation and stuff. Okay, go ahead. God is said to have inspired Moses to write the first five books of the Bible, which is called the Pentateuch. With this, we agree. These are the first five books of the Old Testament. But along with this written text, the Jewish community believes that God gave Moses some oral directions and explanations as well. The Jewish community relies upon a passage of Scripture primarily found in Exodus chapter 24 and in verse 12. I want to read that to you just to give you an idea of where they're coming from on this. In Exodus 24, 12, we read, Now the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and remain there, and I will give you the stone tablets with the law and the commandment, which I have written for their instruction. It is the idea of the Jewish community that when God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses on tablets of stone, he gave Moses much more than that. He, in effect, gave an oral tradition to Moses as well, which is called the Oral Torah. So there are really two Torahs that Moses received on the mountain. He received the written Torah, and then he received an oral Torah. Moses is said to have been given interpretive principles as well as the law, and he had received, while he was up on that mountain, implicit commands from God and explicit commands of God on hermeneutical principles of interpreting the law that he was giving to the nation of Israel. So what, what we have is Moses receiving the Ten Commandments, the tablets of stone, and also instructions on how to interpret the Ten Commandments, and instructions on how to apply the interpretation of the Ten Commandments. All this was given to Moses along with the written law. And of course, Moses wrote, but he also never forgot how to implement and bring to bear the uh, commandments that God had given to him. So this oral Torah has been handed down in the Jewish community orally until what was called the Great Assembly of Ezra. After the Babylonian captivity, at this time, the oral Torah began to be codified. This oral tradition, mind you, had lasted hundreds and hundreds of years, handed down from Jewish leader to Jewish leader to Jewish leader to priests to rabbis to teachers all throughout Israel's history. But it had to be codified. And... It turns out that after the return of Israel from the Babylonian captivity, there was a great assembly of Hebrew scholars. And these are unusual Jewish personalities, and they assume the reins of Jewish leadership at the time. And during this time period, following the destruction of the first temple, after the beginning of the second temple, right up until the time of the Greek invasion of the Middle East, followed by the Roman invasion of the Middle East, these uh, men set the stage for codifying the oral tradition of the law given to God. And uh, it would be impossible to understand this oral Torah unless it had been codified in some sense. So in my research on this, the authors who are explaining, and these are, these are not Christian authors, these are authors who are explaining, many of them Jewish authors, um, 
the uh, oral tradition is just as powerful, just as coming from the hand of God as the written tradition is. So they put them on the same level. They put them on the exact same. Without the old Torah, we would know about the countless ways how Jews are to live day to day. Mm -hmm. That's what's to be found in the oral Torah. Mm -hmm. In addition to ensuring the accurate transmission of oral Torah, the men of the great assembly, aside from codifying it, began to decide which writings would actually be a part of the corpus of the Old Testament scriptures mm -hmm. for the nation of Israel. And the men of the assembly made this decision, and they gave us what we know of today as the Tanakh, which is the Hebrew acronym for the Torah, the prophets, and the writings, or which we know today as the Hebrew Bible of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. So the Hebrew Bible of the Old Testament consists of the written words, mm -hmm. but also the oral tradition. And this oral tradition is going to become very, very strong as it gains momentum mm -hmm. throughout the history of Israel. So during the generations after the Great Assembly, this oral tradition, which is called Mishnah, by the way, I should mm -hmm. say that, mm -hmm. this is the Mishnah. Mm -hmm. The Mishnah was expanded by legislation. It was expanded by case law. And soon the order of the Mishnah was improved. Now this is where it gets a little bit complicated. Mm -hmm. The Mishnah is the oral tradition based upon Jewish law, case study, and it needed some kind of organization. Mm -hmm. And it began, to be, it began to be divided into orders. And the orders are called the Sederim, or what you've probably heard of as the word Seder in the Hebrew tradition. These, this Sederim, or Seder, are six elements. Now this is where we're going to introduce you to a book that was written in the late 1800s. It was written by a Roman Catholic priest who wanted to investigate the Talmud of the, What's the book? Hebrew community. The name of the book is The Talmud Unmasked, The Secret Rabbinical Teachings Concerning Christians. And what's the name of the author? And the name of the author is the Reverend I.B. Pranitis, P-R-A-N-A-I-T-I-S. And how did you get that book? This book can be ordered on Amazon. Oh, okay. I found it on Amazon after okay. researching it in the library. Ah, uh, Pernitus, okay. Pernitus was a master of theology, professor of Hebrew language at the Imperial Ecclesiastical Academy of the Roman Catholic Church in Old St. Petersburg. And this book is copyrighted 1892. When it came out, it was a bombshell because this is the first time that somebody outside of the Jewish community was committing himself to trying to understand the writings and the oral traditions mm -hmm. of the nation of Israel. Hmm. And so he has a nice description of the Talmud. And as I said, the Talmud had to be organized. In order for it to be the Talmud, it had to be organized. And the way it was organized was to be organized by a list of what we call Talmudic books. There are six main parts of the Talmud. And these parts, as I mentioned, are called six orders or six seders. And each seder is divided into tractates or books. And each book is divided into folios or pages. Mm -hmm. So here, that's why I say this is such an advanced study. Yep. It's in a massive amount of material to hold on to. But I just want to give the audience an example of how it's broken down, okay? The list of the Talmudic books are the Zereim, the Moed, the Nashim, the Nezekin, the Kodeshim, the Tahoroth, and these six seders are divided into parts. And these parts, as I mentioned, are called tractates or books. And just to give you an idea how much information there is available for us, there are on average 11, 12, 7, 10, 11, and 12 books to each 
Talmudic book. <laughs> but it doesn't end there because each one of these books called tractates are divided into folios. And there are endless folios attached oh. to each book. So it's a vast amount of information. Mm -hmm. So what is, what is the Talmud then? The Talmud is the entire Old Testament of the nation of Israel, right. the Hebrew Bible. The Law and the Prophets. The Law, the Prophets, and the Writings. Mm -hmm. But it's combined with the oral tradition. Coming from these rabbis and priests and things. Codified and called Mishnah. Mm -hmm. And the Mishnah is divided into six orders called Seders. And each Seder has as many as 12 books. Mm -hmm. And each book has countless folios or pages attached mm -hmm. to them. And mm -hmm. all of it together is called the uh, Talmud. Now, <clears throat> it doesn't stop there. There has to be an analysis mm -hmm. of the tractates, analysis of mm -hmm. the books, analysis of the folios. And these are called commentaries. Mm -hmm. The commentaries on these things are called midrash. But it doesn't end there. The analysis <laughs> is also uh, uh, given down by way of a rabbi interpretation of things over the years. And the rabbi analysis and interpretation of things is called Gemara. So can you remember all that? It just sounds it's like just, it's getting yeah. deeper and deeper and deeper. Yes. And you're trying to dig to the bottom, and it's like, where does this end? I keep yeah. digging, and I keep finding more and more and more. Well, one, one writer, uh, in reference to the Torah, put it this way. The Talmud commands two elements, the Mishnah and the Gemara. The Mishnah is the oral law as it was known up until the end of the second century, and the Gemara is the interpretation of the oral law which the scholars of Babylon mm -hmm. and Jerusalem produced between the beginning of the third AD and the end of the fifth century. So um, if you can relax your mind for a moment and just picture Moses is on the mountain. He's receiving commandments from God. The commandments that we know that are codified and written in the Old Testament are the Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter 20. That's right, the Ten Commandments. But along with this, the Jewish tradition says that God spoke more than that to Moses. He gave him a hermeneutical approach. He gave him interpretive principles, and he gave him commandments on how to interpret the law that he was given and how to apply it to the nation of Israel. Well, this became oral tradition, which is handed down, handed down, handed down, until finally, th through more commentary, more commentary, more commentary on the oral tradition throughout the years, it was codified and set in order by the great uh, um, uh, assembly. And the great assembly divided it into six pieces, and these six pieces are then divided into other pieces, and then those pieces are interpreted and more pieces now, let are me, added Let me it. get a fix on this for the yeah. viewers then. You got all this stuff. It's right. pretty deep uh, right. on all kinds of levels. Right. Now, put this in a, a chronology, a time factor of where was this and what, how developed was it by the time of Jesus? Okay. By the time of Jesus, he was faced with a pharisaical interpretation of the oral traditions as well as the written work. In the Old Testament. The thing you just described. Yeah, that's right. So there was in existence at his time a lot of this stuff that you just described. Oh my goodness, was there ever. There were, there were tons upon tons. When you think of the Pharisees who, who majored in interpreting mm -hmm. and applying the oral traditions that came down, mm -hmm. they, were, they would have uh, uh, a lot to work with, wouldn't they? They would have all the mm -hmm. tractates, all the folios mm -hmm. of the entire oral, the mm -hmm. codified uh, of the oral tradition of the uh, nation of Israel by the uh, uh, men of great So assembly. the stuff you've just described uh, helps our viewers understand what kind of people these Pharisees were and what he's dealing with. Yeah, so when you yeah and that, that, I think you're right. I think that's, that's, the, that's the thing that Jesus ran into. When he said, you nullify the word of God by your traditions, yes. well, he could have gone on and on and on. Because See, now that goes to Matthew 15. 
that that whole chapter there yeah. is yeah. into that kind of discussion. That's right. That's you know? right. Uh, Matthew twenty three. You just find yeah. the, the 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 battles between yeah. Jesus and these Pharisees, who are really putting their faith into all this stuff yeah. you just described. Now, just to bring it up to date, okay? With all with the with the Mishnah, the Gemara, the tractates, the folios, and 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 all of, all of these parts to the oral tradition being codified, some way, somehow, it all had to be put together and written down. Mm -hmm. And there are actually two groups of scholars working at it. There were the Jerusalem scholars who produced a Jerusalem Talmud, mm -hmm. but the, the Talmud that is accepted with the highest amount of praise and the degree of acceptance in the Jewish community today mm -hmm. is called the Babylonian Talmud. In 505 A.D., the Babylonian Talmud, consisting of the written law, the Mishnah, and the Gemara, were put together to form what we know as the Babylonian Talmud. And that is the Talmud that is with us today. Mm -hmm. And it was published by a family of publishers called the Sonsino Publishers. Therefore, it's called Sonsino Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud. Sonsino Talmud, <laughs> and it was published by a family of publishers in the 15th century mm. when, when the, uh, the, the uh, printing press came in, Gutenberg, Gutenberg. Print, Gutenberg. printing press, mm. which helped Luther mm -hmm. spread his theses against right. the Roman Catholic religion. Right beside him, they were printing the Babylonian Talmud, mm -hmm. the Sonsino family was printing it. And the first edition contained 12,800 pages 12, of Hebrew pages. tradition. Wow. Yeah. I can just see those stacked on a shelf somewhere, the, volume after volume. The Mishnah and yeah. the Gemara, and, yeah. it, and it never ends. Right. So the Talmud is not a commentary on the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. It is part of the Old Testament. But it's on the same level. It's, it's on the that's same right. level. It's on the same level. So it's it's integrated into it. In fact, I'm going to read you some quotes here in just a minute from mm -hmm. the Talmud on Mass yeah. by this writer, yeah. which kind of explains things. But I just want the audience to know that the Talmud is not a commentary on the Old Testament. <laughs> the Talmud is intricately involved and on the same level of importance and significance as anything that is written in the Old Testament. But it's based on interpretations and oral traditions. Oral traditions. More so than any analysis or right. exegetical uh, review of uh, Old Testament writings. Right. Rabbinical Judaism regards the Talmud on an equal, if not greater, level of authority as the Old Testament. Now, you just said something that's highly important here in understanding. Or greater, did you say yeah. greater yeah, level? Or greater level. <laughs> According to... Pernatus here, many places in the Talmud tell us that according to tract Baba Mitha, page 33a, we read the following. Those who devote themselves to reading the Bible exercise a certain virtue, but not very much. <laughs> Those who study the Mishnah exercise virtue for which they will receive a reward. Those, however, who take upon themselves to study the Gemara exercise the highest virtue. Okay, now and explain the, once again for the viewers, what is the Gemara compared to the Mishnah? The Mishnah is the codification of the oral tradition okay. brought together by the Great Assembly. Mm -hmm. The Gemara is the commentary on uh, the Mishnah okay. itself. So they're saying okay. the commentaries are the most important. The most important. But reading the Bible is not going to do you much good. Well, the Bible will do you some good, but there's the order. According yeah. to Baba Metziah, mm -hmm. which is one of the track, it's not one of the tractates, it's probably one of the folios from mm -hmm. one of the tractates. Mm -hmm. I tried to find it, but this information is, I don't have it all because You'd have to have volumes and volumes and volumes of it. You right. can buy it all for six hundred dollars, I think. But you just said it's twelve thousand pages, something, right? Right. And I don't, <laughs> I don't know how you would find all the Gemara. I haven't been able to find how you find all the Gemara. But it gives you an idea of uh, of what we're faced with in dealing with Jewish tradition, okay, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what it means to them. 
But if you can keep in mind Torah, law, Talmud, all of it, Mishma, as important as the law in the Old Testament, Gemara, commentary, and then a commentary on the commentary is called Midrash. If you comment if you have a commentary on the Old Testament, it's called Midrash as well. Mm -hmm. It's not a commentary on anything written. <laughs> okay. Jews who reject the oral law of Talmud in favor of the written law of the Old Testament are denounced as idolaters. Hmm. That's how important this is. Wow. It all works together. So you okay. got to, to be a, what they're saying, to be a good Jewish person, you can't just go with the Bible, let's say, or the Old Testament. Right. You've got to take in all this other stuff you've been, this other 12,000 pages and plus of stuff uh, to be like a real true Jew and not an idolater. Yes, absolutely. So if we're looking at, at terms, and you brought up the Pharisees, the Pharisees were a school of learned men in ancient Israel. They were also the ruling political party. Their rivals were the Sadducees, another Sadducees, school of learned yeah. men. But it was the Pharisees who developed and passed down oral law and eventually committed it to the writing. For the early history of the Pharisees and their relationship to the oral law, you don't have to look too far. And that's what Jesus ran into mm -hmm. when he ran into the tradition of the elders and the tradition of the Pharisees and the... the mm -hmm. uh, a uh, 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 rival school of thought of the Sadducees. Which They're Matthew all 15 off on. states so clearly about. And then Matthew 23, which I always thought was one of the harshest chapters in the New Testament, yeah. where Jesus is condemning those same Pharisees big time. Yeah. I mean, it's almost as harsh as it can get from the words of Jesus himself, who is God in the flesh, yep. uh, biblically yep. speaking. So yep. go ahead. I just want to give you one more small category here, if bringing it up into the 21st century, okay? The word midrash in the Hebrew language means seeking, and it deals with the interpretation of the oral tradition that has now been written, okay? And there are two aspects of it. If the interpretation deals with law, it's called halakha. If it deals with non-legal matters and more moral matters, it's called the Haggadah. So you have the Halakha and the Haggadah. One's legal, one's moral. That's how these categories come about. So if you're, a, if you're raised in a Jewish home and it happens to be very serious about the Jewish traditions, the Jewish mm -hmm. commitment to their written mm -hmm. uh, Old Testament as well as the oral traditions that have come down and they study the Talmud, it is a lifetime of work. Mm -hmm. It is a lifetime of work. Mm -hmm. And the commentaries are never ended on this. So, the Pentateuch is called the books of Moses. We know that. The entire Old Testament is called the Hebrew Scriptures. The oral law contained in the Talmud is mixed in with the Old Testament Scriptures with equal importance. The Old Testament, the Talmud, and the entire of Jewish religious writing, including all their rabbis or any combination above, is sometimes referred to as the Talmud. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so that in essence is the Talmud. So strong is the Jewish faith and the Pharisaic ideas contained in the Talmud that Jews who reject the Talmud have been historically labeled as idolaters. In his history of the Talmud, Rabbi Michael Rodkinson writes of the conflicts between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The Sadducees interpreted the Old Testament literally, while the Pharisees interpreted it figuratively. Eventually, the Pharisees triumphed, and the Sadducees ceased as a religious sect in the nation of Israel. I always, you know, that's interesting because I always thought it was the other way around. No. I always thought it was the Sadducees who looked at things kind of like figuratively and things like that. And it was the Pharisees who took things literally. Not according to the history of the Talmud by Rabbi Michael Rodkinson. Interesting. It's, it's just I, the I, I just learned something new. Yeah, it's just the opposite. <laughs> so, so if you go forward and you, and you think of the terms that we throw around, um, 
these terms are not familiar to most Christians, right? Right, right, right. right. I, they're probably saying, my goodness gracious, what is the Pentateuch? Well, mm -hmm. that's the five, first five books that Moses, Moses is the author right, of the Pentateuch, right, right. right? Okay, that's the written, mm -hmm. and that's the law. And then there are the prophets, and then there are the writings, the Psalms and yeah, the prophets yeah, yeah. and things yeah. like that. Okay, so we're, we as Christians are so focused on the New Testament and the unfolding of God's redemptive revelation mm -hmm. in the New Testament that we, we just probably don't have much care or understanding of exactly. all that. That's why what you've explained is just has. really revelatory yeah. yeah. to... Uh, most people have no idea what any of this is about. Now, I'm thinking, as I'm listening to you talk about all this, I'm thinking to myself, okay, Moses has got a direct revelation from God. Yeah. Ten Commandments and all that right. stuff. Written by Moses, God's with him. He's seen God face to face. It's like a direct revelation. Right. Uh, and then I'm thinking, okay, so God's given his word here directly to this man, Moses. Uh, but now, if I'm the devil, if I'm Satan, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking, well, I can't have these people believing this direct revelation from the true and living God, mm -hmm. so what's the best way to mess that up and convolute it, confuse it, yeah. make it so complex that you can hardly make heads or tails out of anything? Yeah. It almost sounds like it's the very way the Talmud was put together. <laughs> Well, <laughs> With all these levels yeah. of interpretation and different rabbis and different priests and this, that, and the other, next thing you know, you got this mass of information set on top of God's original revelation directly to Moses. Okay, let me give you just an example of exactly what you're saying. Remember I said that there are six main parts of the Talmud? Mm -hmm. And I mentioned the names of them. Which I'm sure you've memorized and <laughs> <laughs> You're probably not. I have to go back and read them. But under, underneath the, the main parts of the Talmud are, are these, um, these books, okay? Underneath the books are the pages, right? Mm -hmm. Here's what they deal with. Uh, say, Zeraim contains 11 books. The first book treats of liturgical rules. The second book treats of corners and gleanings of a field. The third book treats of doubtful things, whether or not tithes must be paid on such and such a thing. The fourth book treats of mixtures, treats of various mixings of seeds. The fifth book treats of the sabbatical year. The sixth book, the heave offerings for the priest. The seventh book, the tithe to be given to the Levites. The eighth book, the second tithe. The ninth book, the portion to be given thereof to the priest. The tenth book, the uncircumcised, treats about the fruits of a tree during the first three years after its plantings. And the final book, the eleventh book, treats of first fruits to be brought to the temple. Now remember, that's just the second book of the Talmud divided into 11 others. <laughs> and remember, from these, each of these will have a number of pages. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it goes on and on. Treats of prescriptions for that day, treats of laws concerning the Feast of Tabernacles, treats of the Feast of the New Year, treats of public feasts, minor feasts, comparison of rites on three feasts of uh, Peshach, Sukkoth, and Tabernacles. And then you get down here to this Fourth book of the Talmud treats of laws concerning found property, concerning trust, concerning buying and selling, lending, hiring, renting. Treats of laws concerning real estate, commerce. Treats of courts and their proceedings and the punishment of capital crimes. It, it just never ends. Well, what's interesting to me about it is I'm seeing similarities here from this complex convolution of all these laws and rules and regulations and all these other people putting in right. input over the top of God's original revelation. Right. It reminds me of, uh, of uh, in Islam, they've got Sharia law. And they you have all these rules and regulations that take it down to, you know, what foot do you first use to step into the bathroom? Or, or how many stones should you use to go to the bathroom? Yeah. I mean, yeah. down yeah. to the smallest yeah. little details. Yeah, it's here. And, it's here. And you get it, that similarity also with Roman Catholicism with all their different rules and regulations and, 
all these extra things have been added over the top of what the Bible originally said. Right. Now, I just want to bring this out. To, uh, this, if this wasn't complicated enough, mm -hmm. all right, this author, and I'm speaking of Pernitus in his book here, says, we must add a few remarks about that other very well-known book of the Jews called Zohar. According to some rabbis, Moses, after he had been instructed in the interpretation of the law on Sinai, did not pass this information to Joshua, nor he to the elders, but to Aaron, Aaron to Eliezer, and so on, until the oral teachings had been put into a book form called the Zohar. This is, this is stuff that, that Moses did not pass on. According to, to, according to them. Right. Did not pass on to Joshua, nor to the elders, but he went directly to Aaron and the priestly class. All right. And the author of this is said to have been Rabbi Shimeon ben Jokai, a disciple of Rabbi Akiba Ha, who 50 years after the destruction of the temple ended his life as a martyr about the year 120 A.D. And it goes on to say that this... This book called Zohar consists of three volumes. And these three volumes contain books. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. Nineteen additional books within these three volumes. Mm. And they deal with things like prayers on festivals, um, fountains, uh, prophets, and future redemption, uh, fundamentals, articles of faith, gates of light, celebrated uh, books of the Jewish tradition, dissertations on lineage, sacred Jewish history, a whole new group of books mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. called Zohar. Just layers, that never, and layers, layers and layers. Layers and layers. And like and you layers. said before, it take you almost a lifetime of just digging through all this stuff right. forever. Okay. They, now, having done this, all right, okay. I, I'm going to just say this because we're, we're basically trying to put the ocean in a thimble here, but right, I want right. to get it in, all right? right? The Orthodox Jews, the Hebrew Scriptures, are divinely authored, and therefore every commandment contained therein must be obeyed. The Mishnah and Talmud are considered to have virtually the same status and are called oral Torah. This is a modern Orthodox Jewish rabbi that I've just mm -hmm. quoted, mm -hmm. Rabbi Amy Shiverman. Mm -hmm. Now, they have provision in the Hebrew Scriptures, in the Mishnah, and in the Talmud of something called Beth Din. Have you ever heard of it? Nope. Okay. Most people haven't. From the Talmud comes Beth Din. Beth Din is the house of law or judgment. Beth Din, or house of law or judgment, is a gathering place of three or four learned men acting as a Jewish court. The Beth Din of America has been recognized as one of the nation's preeminent rabbinic courts in the United States for nearly four decades. It serves the Jewish community in the United States as a forum for obtaining Jewish divorces, confirming personal status, adjudicating commercial disputes stemming from divorce, business, and community issues. The, the Orthodox Jewish community in the United States does not take their troubles to the secular courts. Mm -hmm. They take their troubles to Beth Din. These are Jewish courts yes. that are recognized by American law mm -hmm. as bona fide because they fall under the arbitration rules mm -hmm. of the United States of America. Now what's interesting, there is another correlation with Islam, like particularly in the United Kingdom, England, they're already setting up Sharia courts all yeah. over the country yeah. to satisfy Islamic law, even though Islam is separate from the English government, but they're, they're now sanctioning all these Islamic courts to settle disputes. Uh, and this sounds similar, but it's on the Jewish it's side on of the, the United Jewish States. States. Yes, listen to this. The Beth Din of America has been recognized as one of the nation's preeminent rabbinic courts. 
It serves the Jewish community in the United States as a forum firmly anchored in the principles of halakha, Jewish law, the Beth Din has earned a reputation for conducting its fairs with competence, integrity, and fairness. Because the Beth Din conducts its cases in a manner consistent with the requirements of secular arbitration law, its le- rulings are legally binding and enforceable in the secular court system. Mm-hmm. In Jewish law, Jewish parties are forbidden to take their civil disputes to a secular court and are required to have those disputes adjudicated by Beth Din. The London Beth Din sets as an arbitral tribunal in respect of civil disputes, and the parties to any such disputes are required to sign an arbitration agreement prior to a hearing taking place. The effect of this is that the award given to the Beth Din has the full force of the arbitration award and may be enforced by the civil courts. So stemming from the Talmud is something called Beth Din, Mm -hmm. which is a whole network of Jewish law courts Mm -hmm. and Jewish arbitration hearings to settle matters of disputes between Jews Mm -hmm. in their own community. Mm -hmm. I found that to be fascinating. Oh, yes, yes. So it's it's not just a religious thing. It's a civil thing as well. Well, like I said, that's the similarity with Islam because Muhammad was highly uh, influenced by the Jewish, the Jews that were living in Saudi Arabia at the right. time he was. So a lot of what he was doing with his religion, you can start to see the similarities. Exactly. With what's going on with the Jews. Exactly. With their own courts and everything else. Yeah. So that but, was, but not, see, not makes sense. Now, the question is, uh, is the Talmud making a comeback? It is. Mm-hmm. More and more Jewish communities, Jewish families, more and more uh, of them are discovering more of their own heritage, yeah. and they're taking to heart uh, the teachings of the Talmud and the, uh, the, the lessons that have come from that. Uh, now, I, want, I wanted to mention something here since you brought up the Orthodox Jews, mm-hmm. and people can see it on our screen right here. I just wanted to show the difference between some of the... Uh, these Jewish groups. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've got Orthodox Jews, as people can see on the screen there, and Reformed Jews, Conservative Jews, and Secular Jews. And uh, as we read down this, this, this screen graphic, Orthodox Jews, Reformed Jews, Conservative Jews, and Secular Jews are the most influential and important groups within Judaism in the modern period. Orthodox Jews are those who maintain the most traditional beliefs and practices of the religion. They strictly observe the dietary laws called kosher or kushrut and the practice of the Sabbath and are often marked by their ways of dress and appearance. Men undergo the ritual of circumcision when infants. As adults, they wear black suits and hats and sometimes allow their hair in front of their ears to grow into long curls. Women sometimes wear hats or other head coverings and dress modestly. Orthodox synagogues are gender segregated. Reform Judaism began in the 19th century as a movement designed to bring Judaism into line with the ideas of the Western European Enlightenment. Mm. Uh, Reform Jews reject outright what they see as the dogmatic, outdated practices of Orthodox Jews and focus on the ethical dimensions of the faith instead of the traditional rituals, commandments, and practices. Reformed Jews move the Sabbath from Saturday to Sundays, often read scriptures in the vernacular language instead of Hebrew, set aside the kosher dietary codes and the distinctive ways of dress and often discard circumcision as well. The guiding sensibility here is that in order for the religion to be relevant and authentic, it must be reformed and reinvigorated from time to time, which sometimes means changing the fundamental ways in which the religion is practiced. Reformed Judaism is the largest form of Judaism in the United States. Conservative Judaism also began in the 19th century in reaction to what is perceived as the radical nature of Reformed Judaism. The latter, according to conservative Jews, threw out too much of what is vital to the Jewish religion. Mm -hmm. So Conservative Judaism is a sort of middle position between Orthodox and Reform groups. 
Many traditions and practices are retained, but some reforms are instituted as well. Conservative Judaism is the second largest form of Judaism in the United States. And then, of course, you have the secular Jews are those who identify as Jewish culturally, but not religiously. Unlike most other religions, Judaism is passed down through matrilineal bloodlines. That is, a person is a Jew if his or her mother is Jewish. So many Jews identify as Jews and have Jewishness as a core part of their identity, mm -hmm. but they don't believe in God or practice the Jewish faith. They are secular people whose Jewish identity is cultural, not religious. And then finally we have here, religious self-definition. A Gallup survey in 2015 determined that 65% of Israelis in the modern state of Israel say they are either not religious or convinced atheist, while 30% say they are religious. Israel is in the middle of the international religiosity scale between Thailand, the world's most religious country, and China, the least religious. Mm. As of 2009, 8% of Israeli Jews defined themselves as Herodim, meaning they consider themselves to be the only authentic Jews, also known as ultra-Orthodox Jews. An additional 12% as religious, 13% as religious traditionalists, 25% as non-religious traditionalists, not strictly adhering to Jewish law or halakha, and 42% as secular. Hinoni, that's in the Hebrew. As of 1999, 65% of Israeli Jews believe in God and 85% participate in a Passover setter. However, other sources indicate that between 15% and 37% of Israelis identify themselves as either atheists or agnostics. A survey conducted in 2009 showed that 80% of Israeli Jews believe in God, with 46% of them self-reporting as secular. Israelis tend not to align themselves with a movement of Judaism, such as Reform Judaism or Conservative Judaism, but instead tend to define their religious affiliation by degree of their religious practice. Of the Arab Israelis, as of 2008, 82.7 were Muslims, 8.4 were Druze, and 8.3% were Christian. Just over 80% of Christians are Arabs, and the majority of the remaining are immigrants from the former Soviet Union who immigrated with a Jewish relative. About 81% of Christian births are to Arab women. Okay, so what we have in the nation of Israel is uh, interesting, and I think we can kind of summarize it a little bit here. There are those of the nation of Israel who are Orthodox, and they are getting back to their roots, literally uh, incorporating into their life the totality of the Jewish Talmud for their lives. But then there is a group within the nation of Israel who are called conservative Jews, and they are not so much grounded in all of the Talmudic teachings. They may be grounded in some of them, some of the traditions, some of the more popular uh, holidays and, and uh, religious festivals of sorts, but they are not going as far as the Talmud would have them go. And then there's a group of Reformed. They're the modernists who want to reform everything. They want to retain a Jewish identity with some Jewish religion, but certainly not as much as the conservatives and definitely is not as much mm. as uh, the Orthodox. Mm. So those three groups are constantly vying. But, but this is interesting to us as Christians, I would think. The Jewish laws, these court laws, are tangential, I think, to what Paul has to say to Christians. Mm. Doesn't he say that we should not take our disputes before 
unbeliever right. in secular law courts. Right. Doesn't he make that clear? So I find in here fascinating that the Christians seem to be ignoring, in many cases, this very kind of thing, which I'm sure the Apostle Paul is taking from his heritage, right. taking from his Jewish background. That's right. You don't go to the secular courts, mm -hmm. and they don't go to the secular courts still. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, you don't inform anybody if you are a, a, a member of the nation of Israel. You don't inform on anybody. You don't never take them to the secular courts. Mm -hmm. It's not a part of their culture to do so, mm -hmm. even though they have. But this Beth uh, Din, I think, is becoming more and more popular in the United States because more and more uh, uh, people are understanding the secular courts in many cases are corrupt. Before we move on, I just wanted to say a little bit more about the information here that Rob's providing. Informers may be murdered. A Moser is a Jew who brings the unlawful activities of another Jew to the attention of Gentile authorities. According to the Talmud, such informers can be thrown into a pit and not brought out, i.e. murdered, according to the footnote. This is from Rabbi's Jonathan Rosenblatt and Gideon Rothstein of the Riverdale Jewish Center in New York explain the Jewish law pertaining to Mosers, plural, Mosrim. Mosrim, to digress for a moment, were people who betrayed Jews to the governments that would take their money and or lives for no good reason. In such circumstances, a corrupt government that judge Jews differently from others and capriciously. Such informants were seen as a grave danger to the community and could be killed if necessary. Even when the rabbinic authorities in a town decided not to kill a Moser or any other kind of evildoer, you Barata, were seen as providing warrant to expel such a person from the community. This example while not directly applicable to the U.S. or Israel, nevertheless shows that Euphorata as a Halafic concept is still seen as being in full force. Once again, that's coming from Rabbis Rosenblatt and Rothstein. Now, yeah. this, this show here is a, focusing on the Talmud, as you've done uh, you've, you've shown so eloquently already in what we've covered. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted the folks at home to see this little chart here on, on your screen from Wikipedia. It just shows the rabbinic literature, the Talmudic uh, literature, the Mishnah. You know, it's all right there. You can see it on your screen. I'm just going through these pages so people can see it. I'm not going to really go into detail about it. Mm -hmm. But uh, it just shows you how complex as you were, <laughs> as you were talking about. And here's a little bit more as I continue to just uh, let people see what uh, Wikipedia here talks about and what you've already mentioned mm -hmm. in, in your material. But just to show people, you, you, here on this page, you do see the 13 principles of faith. It says the closest that anyone has ever come to creating a widely accepted list of Jewish beliefs is Rambam's 13 principles of faith. These principles, which Rambam thought were the minimum requirements of Jewish belief are one, God exists. Two, God is one and unique. Three, God is in, incorporeal. Four, God is eternal. Prayer is to be directed. Number five, prayer is to be directed to God alone and to no other. Six, the words of the prophets are true. Seven, Moses' prophecies are true and Moses was the greatest of the prophets. Eight, the written Torah, first five books of the Bible, and oral Torah, teachings now contained in the Talmud and other writings were given to Moses. Nine, there will be no other Torah. Ten, God knows the thoughts and deeds of men. Eleven, God will reward the good and punish the wicked. Twelve, the Messiah will come. Thirteen, the dead will be resurrected. And then, of course, there's more information there that mm -hmm. the people here at home can see on their screen. And it's going down the uh, to the last part of what Wikipedia had, here had to say to page 10, mm -hmm. you can see that information. Okay, I just wanted to stick that in real fast. Go okay. ahead, Rob. Yeah, I want to get back to this uh, attitude toward Gentiles uh, because I think that uh, if you're a Christian, 
you might be sitting out there saying, well, what does this have to do with me? In, in the uh, writings of the Talmud, there is uh, a number of statements made that are not very complimentary toward Jesus Christ or toward his mother, Mary, or towards Christianity in general. As you can imagine, they do not believe that Jesus Christ was the Savior, was the uh, Messiah. They do not believe that uh, he was raised from the dead. They do not believe that he ascended into heaven. They don't believe he's the Son of God. So they're not going to have a kind attitude toward Christians at all, and they even have a worse attitude toward uh, the nations surrounding them, the pagan nations. In fact, the heathen nations and the Christians are sort of thrown together. It sounds almost like the Talmud was written by the Pharisees that Jesus encountered, and who also had him crucified by the Romans. Well, they're reading, they're reading the Talmud, and the Talmud has nothing good to say about uh, 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 Jesus Christ. They're, they're, in their day, he didn't, fit, he didn't fit what the Talmud teaches that's right. He didn't fit in, uh, he, he so they had fit, him crucified by right. turning him over to the Romans. Right. So these are the guys for the, the writings of the Talmud and stuff. They're the ones that actually had Jesus crucified back then. And then their fathers and their generations after him right. just followed along the right. same line. He didn't, he didn't fit the uh, oral tradition. He didn't fit the Talmud. And of course, they don't believe that he fulfilled anything of the written Old Testament right. at all. Okay, especially Isaiah 53. Mm. Okay, so the question becomes, we wonder if the Rabbinical Council of California tells its non-Jewish clients that under Jewish law, Jews are favored over Gentiles. Now, we're Gentiles, all right? Yes. We're not Jews. Right. Uh, forget the idea of Christian for the moment. Here's what we read in the Mishnah. Where an ox belonging to an Israelite has gored an ox belonging to a Canaanite there is no liability. Mm. Whereas where an ox belonging to a Canaanite gores an ox belonging to an Israelite, whether while Tam or Mu'ad, the compensation is to be made in full. If my ox gores yours, I'm off the hook. If mm. your ox gores mine, you pay in full. That's Mishnah. That's what the Mishnah says about the Gentile nations surrounding them. It okay? doesn't sound very fair and just. Here's another idea. As Canaanites did not recognize the laws of social justice, they did not impose any liability for damage done by cattle. They could consequently not claim to be protected by a law they neither recognized nor respected. In ancient Israel, as in the modern state, the legislation regulating the protection of life and property of the stranger was, as shown, on the basis of reciprocity. Where such reciprocity was not recognized, the stranger could not claim to enjoy the same protection of the law as a citizen. So if you don't have a law whereby if your, go your ox gores another man's ox that you get full compensation. If we gore your ox, you're not getting any full compensation from us either. Mm -hmm. That's Mishnah. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, so, moving forward in this whole discussion of the Talmud, we would perhaps like to know what the Talmud, especially the Socino Talmud, the Babylonian mm -hmm. Talmud, the one mm -hmm. that was printed in yes. the 1500s, what does it have to say about Christians? That yes. was the question of uh, our man here. He wanted to know what does the Talmud have to say specifically about Christians. It's not favorable. I can tell you that right now. According to our author here, there is a great deal that is spoken of in the Talmud against Christianity specifically. A Jew may lie and perjure himself to condemn a Christian. A Jew may perjure himself with a clear conscience. Jews must always try to deceive Christians. A sick Christian must not be aided. 
A Christian woman in childbirth must not be helped. A Christian in danger of death must not be helped. Christians are to be harmed directly, if at all possible. The Talmud commands that Christians are to be killed without mercy. The Abhoda Zarah, 26b, says, Heretics, traitors, and apostates are to be thrown into a well and not rescued. Christians are to be killed because they are tyrants. The people of the earth are idolaters, and it has been written about them. Let them be wiped off the face of the earth. Destroy the memory of the Amalekites. They are with us still in this fourth captivity, namely the princes of Rome who are really Amalekites. These princes must be killed first with reference to Roman Catholic princes. Mm -hmm. So one would ask oneself, where does this come from? How deep does this teaching go? Here it is, okay? This is of great interest to me as a Christian and hopefully to you as a Christian if you're watching this video. I'm going to quote from uh, this book, The Talmud Unmasked, who quotes from a portion of Zohar. The teaching of the Jews is that God created two natures, one good and the other evil, or one nature with two sides, one clean and the other unclean. From the unclean side, called Calipha, rind or scrabby crust, the souls of Christians are said to have come from this unclean side. Idolatrous people, however, since they exist, befoul the world because their souls come out of the unclean side. The souls of the impious come from the unclean side, which is death in the shadows of death. And he created every living thing, that is, the Israelites, because they are children of the Most High God, and their holy souls come out from him. But where do the souls of the idolatrous Gentiles come from? Rabbi Eliezer says in Zohar 146b, from the left side, which makes their souls unclean. They are therefore all unclean, and they pollute all who come in contact with them. From which side do the Christians come? They come from the left side. They are unclean and pollute all who come in contact mm -hmm. with them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just reading this from Zohar, which is mm -hmm. said to be one of the foundational books of the tradition of the right. uh, Jewish text. The elders teach that Abraham sits at the gate of Gehenna and prevents any circumcised person from entering there but that all the uncircumcised go down to hell. How about that? Mm -hmm. All uncircumcised go down to hell. The bodies of dead Christians are called odious, which is a word used in Holy Scripture for the dead bodies of damned and the dead bodies of animals. Thus, one of the tractates says, Condolences must not be offered to anyone on account of the death of a servant or handmaiden. All that may be said is, may God restore your lost one, the same as we say to a man who has lost his cow or his ass. Mm -hmm. So there are citations after citations of what portions of the Talmud says about Christians. Now, I, course, wanted to, I wanted to go, <laughs> I want to go on to this uh, as well with some of my references here. And people can see it on the screen mm -hmm. coming from the Talmud, uh, particularly the Babylonian Talmud, as you've mentioned before. We can see here, what about Jesus in the Talmud? Right. It says in, in the Babylonian edition, the Talmud records other sins of Jesus the Nazarene. One, he and his disciples practiced sorcery and black magic, led Jews astray into a, uh, idolatry, and were sponsored by foreign Gentile powers for the purpose of subverting Jewish worship. That's in Sanhedrin 43a. The, the Talmud says, Jesus, he was sexually immoral, worshipped statues of stone and brick. His mention was cut off from the Jewish people for his wickedness and refused to repent. That's Sanhedrin 107b. Three, he learned witchcraft in Egypt. This is talking about Jesus. Your references are there. I'm not going to People at home can see this. 57a says Jesus is in hell being boiled in hot excrement. 
Sanhedrin 43a says Jesus was executed because he practiced sorcery. Quote, it is taught that on the eve of Passover, Jesus was hung. And 40 days before this, the proclamation was made, Jesus is to be stoned to death because he has practiced sorcery and has lured the people to idolatry. He was an enticer of such that thou shalt not pity or condone, end quote. And then you have here, I'm going to shorten this up here, but people, it's all on the screen. You can just see it. Uh, Talmud says that Jesus' mother was a whore. She was a descendant of princes and governors, played the harlot with carpenters. Uh, Miriam, the hairdresser, had sex with many men. And people can just kind of look through this uh, chart. It said, hitting a Jew is the same as hitting God. Uh, if a Gentile hits a Jew, the Gentile must be killed. <laughs> okay, to cheat non-Jews. And this ties into what you were saying. A Jew need not pay a Gentile the wages owed him for work. Jews have superior legal status. And this goes into what you just quoted. Jews may steal from non-Jews. That kind of ties into what you were saying. Mm -hmm. Jews may rob and kill non-Jews. When a Jew murders a Gentile, there is no death penalty. What a Jew steals from a Gentile, he may keep. The Gentiles are outside the protection of the law, and God has exposed their money to Israel. And it goes on, Jews may lie to non-Jews. Non-Jewish children are subhuman. Even the best of women, that is of the Gentiles, are witches. Possessions of the more wives, the more witchcraft. Anyway, you can see all that for yourselves in, the, in these references here. I just wanted to insert this little segment here concerning Muhammad and his religion in the stark correlation between what the Jews are saying about Christians and other Gentiles and non-believers and what Muhammad and his religion are saying about non-believers in Muhammad's religion of Islam. Keep in mind that at the time of Muhammad, the Talmud was already in existence. So he may have picked up a lot of his ideas for his Islamic religion from the Talmud itself. So anyway, look at the correlation here. It's rather stark. Muhammad and his religion are against all unbelievers of Islam. When one reads the three Muslim authoritative sources that make up what Islam actually is, the Quran, the Sirah, which is the life of Muhammad, and the Hadith, which are Sunni authoritative teachings and sayings of Muhammad, one discovers that Islam has a very important theological term called kafir. Kafir is the Islamic term for a non-Muslim. The word kafir is not a neutral term, but is rather one of the most negative and reviled words in any language as far as Islam is concerned, and certainly leads to much religious bigotry. Here's just a few references from the Muslim Quran in regards to how Muslims are to treat kafirs, all unbelievers in Islam. 1. A kafir can be mocked. That's in Quran 83, verses 34 through 36. 2. A kafir can be beheaded. Quran chapter 47, verses 4 and following. 3. A kafir can be plotted against. That's in Quran 86, verse 15. Four, a kafir can be terrorized. That's Quran, chapter 8, verse 12 and following. Number five, a kafir is not to be the friend of a Muslim. That's in Quran, chapter 3, verse 28 and following. Number six, a kafir is evil. That's in Quran, chapter 23, verse 97 and following. Number seven, a kafir should be disgraced. That's in Quran, 37, 18 and following. 8. A kafir is cursed. That's in Quran 3360 and following. Of the three main sources that comprise what Islam is, namely the Quran, the Hadith, and the Seer of Muhammad, we find that 64% of the Quran talks about kafirs and what to do with them. 81% of the Seer of Muhammad talks about kafirs and what to do with them. And 37% of the Hadith talks about kafirs and what to do with them. For more on Islam, see our website, www.muslimhope.com. Let me, let me back up a little bit with you. 
You quoted something from the Sanhedrin, okay, mm -hmm. uh, several times yes. in explaining their opinion about Jesus or Mary. Now, I'm just going to hold this up for the audience to see. When we first started out with our study, we talked about the Talmudic books, and they're divided into six seders, or six sections. The first one was Zerahim, and then Moed, and Nashim, but the fourth one is Nesekin. It's right here, and one of the tractates of it is tractate number four, the Sanhedrin. So, if you have an interest in reading these tractates, and these folios, these pages that come out of these tractates, then I think it'd be pretty easy because the Socinian Tal uh, Talmud already has been published, and you can go right to the direct source. We didn't have time, and nor would we have time in a yes. video of this length to go to each one. But these are not made up. This is exactly what we're talking about in the uh, Talmud itself. And I want to go back and remind you that Moses receives written law plus oral revelation. The oral revelation is codified, and it's called Mishnah. The Mishnah is divided into six seders, and eventually it becomes written in the Sosino Talmud. Each seder is divided into tractates or books, and each tractate is divided into folios or pages. That's the way it works. So all of this is available for your research, and I think the significance to us as Christians, Larry, is probably twofold. In the first place, the Jewish people are lost. Mm -hmm. I don't care if they're Orthodox Jews, conservative Jews, <laughs> or Reformed Jews. Mm -hmm. They're lost because they do not accept the New Testament as the Word of God. They do not believe that Jesus Christ is the long-awaited Savior the one of whom Moses spoke, the great prophet to come. And because of that, they're outside of Christ. So in a way, it makes sense that they would reject everything about Gentiles and Christians. I wanted to interject at this moment for our viewers. Uh, Rob just had stated that the, the Jews are lost in their current condition with their Talmud and other beliefs that uh, go contrary to the Christian religion. So if you are a Christian listening and you're looking for a way to witness to the Jews who hold these Talmudic teachings, it'll be difficult though. It's very difficult because uh, remember what Jesus said in uh, Matthew chapter 12 verses 30 through 32. Whoever is not with me is against me. Whoever does not gather with me scatters. And so I tell you, any sin and blasphemy can be forgiven. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And of course, that's coming, as I said, from Matthew chapter 12, verses 30 to 32. So the Jews, obviously, Jesus was talking to them in his day and accused them of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And so it's imperative for us as Christians to be able to witness to them for Christ because they're under a curse from Jesus himself based on what the Talmud itself teaches and what the Jews in the New Testament also did. And the way I would recommend is the best way to go about it, although the Jews have really tried to insulate themselves from it, is biblical prophecy. All the fulfilled prophecies of Jesus coming from the Old Testament that were fulfilled in the New Testament showing that he is the Jewish Messiah. And we have two videos on our YouTube channel, C Answers TV, which stands for Christian Answers Television. The first video, of course, is Supernatural Bible Prophecy Concerning Jesus the Jewish Messiah, Part 1. It's sort of like biblical prophecy. It's absolute certainty beyond time. And, of course, the second video in that mini-series is called Supernatural Bible Prophecy Concerning Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, Part 2. And, of course, you can see just one of those many hundreds of Old Testament prophecies about the coming Messiah. Here you see Isaiah chapter 53. And uh, we're going to play a little clip from show number two here just to give you a little taste of some of these messianic 
prophecies showing who the true Jewish Messiah is, and it can only be Jesus. So here's a little clip from show number two in that miniseries. And these things can help you when you're trying to witness to Jewish people who are into this Talmudic teaching and tradition. And what's interesting about Isaiah 53, this is not just one verse. Right. This is like 12 verses, yeah. the whole chapter. <laughs> so go ahead with Isaiah 53 out of the Old Testament Messianic prophecy. Okay. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord make his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. And by his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong. Because he poured out his life unto death, and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Isaiah 53, 1-12. Now, here we have a, a classic Messianic prophecy. The whole chapter uh, is referring, basically, when you go with the New Testament record about the gospel of Jesus Christ, there's no one else that could, this Isaiah passage could be referring to than Jesus Christ. And it matches off to everything we know about the crucifixion of Christ, how he's going to bear our sins, Bear the sins of many. He's going to be crushed by God for our iniquities. Uh, uh, you know, he didn't open his mouth. Here's before Pontius Pilate, all these accusers, things of that nature. Uh, as we read through here, uh, we find, uh, you know, he, he's, he's, uh, he's slain with the wicked, but he's buried with the rich. You know, he was, he's buried in a rich man's tomb. Right. Uh, all these things uh, tie in with what we know about Jesus. And here Isaiah is writing hundreds of years before uh, Christ was ever born. Mm -hmm. uh, and, about and, 700 years. Yeah, yeah, about 700 years. And in some of these other prophecies we were mentioning, uh, we started out with Genesis 3.15. That was almost 1,500 years or so before Christ was born. And as we've been moving through these prophecies, we're talking about prophecies made centuries before they were actually fulfilled. Yeah. Now, now, one thing about it, some Jewish people try to say this refers to the Jewish nation. Right. right. However, this servant uh, has not been rebellious, unlike the Jewish nation, according to Isaiah 50, verse 5. Mm -hmm. so, if, so if the Jewish nation, let's say they were punished with exile because of the rebelliousness, the, the suffering servant here, he was not punished for anything that he did wrong. He mm -hmm. was... Uh, iniquities are put on him and he bore chastisement for our sake, not right. for a discipline right. of him. So their interpretation is, is fallacious mm -hmm. due to just any kind of typical analysis. All these clues as to who the Messiah is, and it looks like there's only one possible candidate, mm -hmm. particularly when we're talking about that 483 years, which is already in the past. Right. So there's no future Messiah that can, take, that can come because the prophecies don't call for that. So it's already happened. The, the Messiah, according to history and the record, has already come. And it can only be Jesus Christ. Now with that, I want to take a look once again at uh, uh, these, these other prophecies. We examine just a few of the prophecies concerning the Messiah found in the Hebrew Scriptures. Had we space, there would be dozens of others which we could have discussed that are just as specific as these. One. He will be born of a virgin, Isaiah 7, 14. See Matthew 1, 23. Number two, he will live in Nazareth of Galilee, 
Isaiah 9, 1 through 2, see Matthew 2, 23, chapter 4, verse 15. 3, he will occasion the massacre of Bethlehem's children. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 15, uh, see Matthew 2, 18. 4, his mission would include the Gentiles. Isaiah 42, 1 through 3, verse 6, see Matthew 12, 18 through 21. 5, his, his ministry would include physical relief. Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 2, see Luke 4, 16 through 21. 6, he would be the shepherd struck with the sword, resulting in the sheep being scattered. Zechariah 13, verse 7, see Matthew 26, verse 31, verse 56, Mark 14, 27, Verses 49 through 57, he will be betrayed by a friend for 30 pieces of silver. Old Testament, Je Zechariah chapter 11, verses 12 and 13. See Matthew 27, 9 through 10. He would be given, number eight, he would be given vinegar and gall to drink. Psalm 69, verse 21. See Matthew 27, 34. Nine, he would be presented with all dominion over all peoples, nations, and men of every language. Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. See Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. 10, he would be hated without a cause. Psalm 69, verse 4. Isaiah 49, verse 7. John 7, 48. And John 15, 25. Number 11, he would be rejected by the ruler. Psalm 118, verse 22. Matthew 21, verse 42. John 7, 48. As we see all this, go ahead, Stephen, read this, this little quotation here. All right. The Leech and Globe have rightly stated, So far as we can determine, these prophecies refer to the Messiah only and cannot be predicated of another. The ancient Jews admit the messianic character of most of them, although the modern Jews, in consequence of the controversy with the Christians, have attempted to explain them away by applications which must appear to every candid reader to be unnatural. Dot, dot, dot. These and other predictions have received their accomplishment in Jesus of Nazareth. Dot, dot, dot. The combination of prophecies is sufficient to prove that Jesus is the Messiah. And that's uh, 52, uh, pages 123 and 124. In speaking with some friends of mine the other day, one, one of them uh, produced a book written by a Pentecostal scholar, and he was chastising the way that Christians adore Martin Luther for his beginning of the Protestant Reformation. And uh, he objected to the language that Luther used against the Roman Catholic hierarchy, the popes, and so forth and so on. Uh, and uh, he also mentioned that Luther had nothing good to say about the Jewish community. And that disturbed him greatly, that, Jew that the uh, Jewish community was lambasted in language by Luther that was far greater than the language that he used to absolutely cut to the quick the Roman Catholic religion. But in thinking about this, I wonder how much of the Talmud Luther had been able to ascertain during his time. So, Larry, I just want to read to you right here this one paragraph from this article. Martin Luther then read the Talmud as introduced to him by a truly converted Jew. Afterwards, he wrote The Jews and Their Lies with such denunciatory philippics, a word I'm not familiar with, <laughs> that they make parallel utterances of the popes almost pale by comparison. This only after he became aware of the truth of what the Talmud said about Jesus Christ and Christianity. Without any modern-day Jewish encyclopedias, or Sonsino translations of the Babylonian Talmud, one sees that Luther nevertheless understood perfectly the way the Talmud blasphemes and hangs obscene charges on Christ through double talk and words. The Balaam passages of the Talmud are an example of this, but Luther names others. Luther recognized that any Messiah expected by Jewry was only supposed to lead them in slaughter to power, Luther wrote, I maintain that in three fables of Aesop, there is more wisdom to be found than in all the books of the Talmudists and the rabbis, and more than ever could come into the hearts of the Jews. 
Should someone think I'm saying too much, I am not saying too much, but much too little. Luther lived in a day when he was introduced to two people that hated the gospel, the Roman Catholic person and the Jewish person. And he didn't hold his punches back from either group. And I read these things directly out of the research from the Talmud on mask of what the Talmud says about Mary, says about Jesus Christ, says about Christianity. And Luther had the same information at hand and his opinion of the matter was, I haven't said too much, I've said too little. I'm not sure what kind of relationship the nation of Israel has to Christians. I've never been there. It has been my understanding that if you were to try to witness for Christ openly in the public square, hand out tracts, distribute Bibles, and talk about the new covenant in Christ to Jews on the streets, that there might be a recriminatory yeah, I've by, heard the, by the government. I've heard I'd have to check that out, but certainly... Uh, there are a number of Christians in the United States of America who think that because God began his redemptive program with the nation of Israel, that the current Israel can do no wrong and is a friend of biblical Christianity. It most assuredly is not. The more Jewish you are, the more you hate Christianity. That is completely apparent from their writings. So... Uh, I, I would use caution in recommending that we align ourselves theologically in any sense of the term with the nation of Israel because as we have mentioned, there are three kinds of Jews and the rest of them are either atheists or, av or, or, or Muslim. Very few Christians in the nation of Israel. And the Talmud is written proof of what they thought of Christianity and if they are going back to the Talmud, and I think they are, then uh, it's going to come out even in more now, uh, graphic uh, uh, relief of Now, speaking of graphic uh, yeah. examples, uh, and tying back into what she just said, and what Luther particularly said, he didn't say enough. Right. Cause see, you're, you've been focusing just uh, on what it says about Gentiles and Christians right. and Jesus right. and right. Mary, somewhere in there. Uh, the Talmud talks about Mary, you know, well, I already mentioned one reference about her being a whore, and, right. and she gave birth to Jesus through whoredom with the Roman soldiers and other reference. But uh, anyway, I want to just show for the audience here, and you can see it on your screen, just some of the stuff that Luther is reading that he said all this stuff is just no guess. It's it's a waste. It's a it's right. it's worth not just right. what he what the Talmud's saying about Christians and Gentiles and all this stuff, but it's just well, you be the judge. Let right. me just you can see on your screen. Uh, it says here at the top of the page, exposition of Talmud passages. Now I'm just going to take some random. I'm not going to read this whole page, but I'll just take some random stuff that I just happen to look at. Yabamoth uh, 20a page 116. That's point five. Uh, it says, those who obey the rabbis are holy. Those who disobey are wicked. Just looking down the page, studying the Bible is a matter of indifference to God. Studying the Talmud is meritorious. That's point eight. Uh, point nine, studying the Bible after studying the Talmud produces trouble, <laughs> which I think is really true because you're going to see a big difference between one and the other. Just looking down the page here, second column, the wisdom of the Talmud. Let's take just point randomly, point 19. It uh, gives you the reference from the Talmud, and it says, Epilepsy is caused by standing naked in front of a lamp or sexual relations with the light on. So, uh, you know, that, that gives you an example of the kind of wisdom you can learn from the Talmud, that you better not have sex with the light on or you might end up with epilepsy. Okay, uh, Point 20, eating beef and turnips causes fever if it is followed by sleeping in the summer moonlight. Here we go, point 22, not burying cut fingernails causes miscarriages. Mm. You see, now this is some real wisdom to live your life by. Uh, everyone has two kidneys, uh, this is for number 23, one which inspires good deeds, the other bad deeds. 24, after 
Seven years, hyenas turn into bats. After even longer periods, they turn into thorns and demons. It says in number 25, dogs in strange towns don't bark for seven years. Mm. You know, this is important stuff to remember and consider if you think the Talmud's really giving you some good information. Let's try 28 here. Bad tempered caused by birth on Monday. Riches and sexual promiscuity caused by birth on Tuesday. Those who desecrate the Sabbath by being born there will die on the Sabbath. 30. It is forbidden for dogs, women, or palm trees to pass between two men. Nor may others walk between dogs, women, or palm trees. Special dangers are involved if the women are menstruating or sitting at a crossroads. 31. Demonic danger involved when one drinks water on the evenings of Wednesdays and Sabbaths. Just skipping along here to just whatever mm. I just happened to hit, but it's all kind of interesting. So right? it, 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 the bottom line is that it not only is dangerous to Christians, anti-Christian to the hilt, but it's just plain stupid. In its well, that's what Luther yeah. was referring to. Because yeah, if stupid. you just get to read it for yourself, yeah. to see, but most people never read it. I know. Don't have a clue. Yeah. yeah. So they don't understand. Yeah. But let's continue with some yeah. of this stuff since I have it here, and uh, this will probably be the only show we ever do on the Talmud. Uh, but forty-five, it says Adam had sexual intercourse with all the animals in the Garden of Eden. Where's that from? That's uh, from the Talmud, Nazar. 23b, page 84, that's point forty five on the first page here. Okay. Uh, it's, it, it goes on to some more sexual stuff there. Let's look at the next page. I'm just going to skip around, but like I said, y'all can freeze frame and read all this stuff coming right out of the Talmud. And it's supposed to be the wisdom of the ages. Let's see, 52, I just picked it by random. I didn't even read it. Uh, it says, a man is not guilty of murder if he causes a poisonous snake to kill a man. The snake should be executed for murder while the man goes free. Mm. So see, it was the snake that killed the person. It wasn't the person who put the poisonous snake where it could bite somebody. Mm. So there you have it. It's right out of the Talmud. Here we go, 55. If ten men hit another with sticks so that he died, all are not guilty of murder. Also, killing a terminally ill person is not murder. A lot about killing here and stuff like that. It says here in 61, hating your enemy is permitted, even commanded. Some of this is, quote, giving other Bible references that contradict that. So I just read what the Talmud itself said. We see down here, point 62, God made Adam with two faces. 63, fish used to be able to pull wagons. Uh, 64, going seven days without a dream proves that the person is evil. So if you go seven days without a dream, you're an evil person. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's all mostly nonsense. Well, that's what Luther yeah. was referring to because yeah. he had an opportunity yeah. to read it. To and read we're, it. Making, we're making it available right now through this video. Right. And see, now look on this same page at the top on the last column here, the Talmud's view of Gentiles. And see, and it goes into the very stuff you were talking right, about. Right, right. Ha- and it has the references. So I'm not going to read this, but freeze frame your screen and you can read it for yourself. But Rob's already covered that topic mm-hmm. quite well. Looking at the next page, let's see what we got here. I'm going to uh, skip a lot of this. Just go to where it says sexual matters. I don't know what it's going to say yet until I read some of this, but let's find out. It says 134 in the third column. It is permitted to have sexual intercourse with a girl three years and one day old. Mm. So you're allowed to have sexual intercourse with a girl three years and one day old. Now, I'm seeing there's a lot of videos on the Internet uh, concerning the Islamic religion and how uh, Muhammad, the Islamic prophet, uh, married a six-year-old girl Mm. and consummated the marriage when she was nine years old, Aisha, his favorite yeah, wife, yeah, yeah. his child bride. And that's why even today in Islamic countries, uh, Muslim men in their 50s and 60s are marrying little six-year-old girls because, after all, Muhammad is the perfect example of how to live your life according to Islam. So, But now, Muhammad has nothing on the Talmud, though. 
<laughs> from what I, I just I from what I just read, it is yeah. permitted to have sexual intercourse with a girl three years and one day old. Uh, then we look down here, thirty-five. Intercourse with a married woman is not adultery as long as the male membrum is relaxed. Intercourse with a dead woman is apparently permissible. Mm. Uh, mm. Now that's mm. that's getting really strange mm. and bizarre. Yeah. Uh, it says in 136, if a priest's wife is raped, the priest is no longer allowed to have sexual relations with her on penalty of being whipped. Though a priest, this is 137, though a priest may not marry a harlot, he may marry a woman guilty of bestiality. Mm. So we're getting some... And, 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 you, it, you know, it, yeah, it, you go on and on and on and on. There are thousands of quotations. Yes. We're talking about a massive amount of literature here over yeah. thousands of years. Yeah, so yeah. It just never ends. It just never ends. Yeah. It says here in 142, any unnatural sex act is allowable for a Jew with his wife. Deafness is called, this is 143, is caused by couples talking during sexual intercourse. Mm. So you can go deaf. Various other sicknesses and their supposed causes. And like you said, I can just read this on. There's Talmud on Jesus yep. again. Mary was a whore. Jesus was excommunicated by a rabbi because he was a magician and led Israel astray. Jesus was a magician and a fool. Mary was an adulteress. And it just goes on there on that page. Now, looking at this next page, where well, I'm almost done here, I just wanted to, mm. people don't get it often to be able to see some yeah. of these direct quotations, sure. so I'm taking some time on it. But the Talmud and Christians, that goes more to what you've already covered quite well here on this page. It, it says that uh, in the Talmud, Nebuchadnezzar's membrum extended 450 feet. Uh, <laughs> you've got, you got some... Now, I don't, I'm not going to go into what that, what a member That's is. a heavy weight there. <laughs> but, but, but what we're, what we're able to tell, now looking at the next page, the Talmudic citation, when we didn't believe in some ramblings on homosexuality and Reformed Judaism. I'm not going to read any of this, but if you want to freeze frame the screen, there's another reference there for that cartoon about how you can, it's permitted to have sexual intercourse with a girl three years and one day old. Mm -hmm. I already you know, got to that reference a while ago on human sexuality. Then going on to the next page, Judaism and paganism, things of that nature. I'm not going to read that. You can just read it for yourself and go from there. Let's see, back here on this last page, uh, the Jewish book of lies, and that goes into what uh, what uh, Luther referenced to, and just other information concerning it, and for these references are, uh, and you got the references to Mary here with that picture, Jesus being a bastard and his mother being a prostitute and st mm. stuff like that. Okay, uh, Rob, we, we gave uh, people a, a better understanding from those ref those few references we got yeah. to. There, you said, like you said, there's thousands and thousands of pages that, you know, ultra orthodox Jews who consider themselves to be the only real true Jews mm -hmm. are supposed to follow and believe. Uh, any other information you want to give before I get into uh, some information about how to witness the people of the Jewish faith? Well, I just want to say that uh, you would think that all of this would have gone away in the 21st century. You would think that people would say this is so ancient and miserable that we want to leave it far behind. But according to the uh, research I have done, there is a growing movement toward Talmudism reflected by a New English translation of the Talmud. And it's called the Schottenstein English Translation. These new volumes have been prepared by a team of accomplished scholars who distill the essence of the classic sources and commentators. Acclaimed by a broad spectrum of scholars and laymen, this series fills the need of those who wish to study the Talmud in the classic manner without oversimplification, extraneous material, or unnecessary turgidity. This is statement made by Masora Publications Limited. If we ever wanted to do a follow-up on this, I would think that we would want to get a copy yes. of the new uh, English translation of the Talmud. 
Yeah. And let's just see how much they keep and how much they That's right. throw out. And let's just see. Let's compare it. Of course, it would be. With the Socino. We could already know in advance, though, just from knowing what type of people these are. Are they uh, those four groups of Jews that we discussed yeah. earlier? Yeah. If they're Reformed Jews, well, they could throw it all out. Right. It wouldn't matter to that them. One, yeah. uh, conservative, conservative might, that, little bit, right? Middle road, they might yeah. throw out some, maybe yeah. keep some. Uh, the Orthodox or ultra Orthodox, well, they would keep it all. Yes. And yeah. then the secular Jews, well, they would probably do what the Reformed Jews right. <laughs> throw it all in the we're trash. Not interested, right? so, but that's how yeah. we learn more about that. Now, yeah. you were getting, you kind of touched on it briefly, and then we diverted off into back into the Talmud. Mm -hmm. But I want to finish with this uh, for okay. our viewers. I want to get into, and you can see it on the screen there, how to witness the people of the Jewish faith, myths and facts. And uh, here we go. We got, there are several popular myths which keep people from sharing with their Jewish friends. Some of them include the myth, all Jews are well-versed in the Old Testament. Right. Uh, I don't think that's going to be true, simply from seeing what their rabbis and the hotshots have said in the Talmud. But uh, anyway, fact, most Jews have a strong cultural identity with a very limited knowledge of the scriptures. But that's, that's nothing unusual, actually, right. when you think right. about it. Most Christians don't even know <laughs> much about the Bible, right. at least the right. ones that profess Christianity. I've got right. a video uh, called 87% of evangelical Christians mm -hmm. don't know what the gospel is, mm -hmm. and they don't know what justification by faith is. Right. And people at home are seeing a, a screenshot of that video, and I would welcome you to go check that out and get the poll numbers and everything. Mm. And I've got a new video coming out pretty soon on how bad it really is in Christendom, mm. on biblical knowledge mm. and understanding of the scriptures. It's, mm. it's pathetic. Mm. And when you think about it in, in, in Christendom, just the groups calling themselves Christians like liberal Christians. Mm -hmm. But we know liberal Christians, I call them fake Christians, right. because they don't really believe almost everything the Bible says. Yeah. Uh, I'm not counting groups like the Roman Catholicism or these, these groups, Eastern Orthodox. I'm not counting, I'm just talking about the, the ones that claim to be the real true Christians, mm -hmm. which are evangelicals. Right. 87% of them don't even know what the gospel is. How can they be Christian if they don't know what the gospel is? There you go, which means yeah. only 13% of them are real Christians. Yeah. And 87% of them are phony, just like all these other phony outfits that yeah. call themselves Christians. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a pathetic situation. It is, and uh, the statistics bear that out. It's a, yes. it's a... So it's no wonder that the Jews themselves don't even know what the scriptures say. Yeah. And when I talk to Muslims, for instance, I usually know far more about what the Quran and the Hadith, the authoritative Islamic Hadith, the Sirah Muhammad, mm. I know more about what their religion teaches than they do mm. in yeah. most cases. So we shouldn't be surprised. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. why? Why? We were talking off camera about yeah. how I said I'm very cynical. Yeah. <laughs> wow. People say, I don't understand why they can do this. And I say, well, I do. It's because. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> they don't know the truth. And there, it, there's a passage in Romans chapter 1 where God, it says God turned them over to a reprobate mind. Mm -hmm. And once you understand that and how a lot of these people are doing the things they do because they have repro reprobated minds by a sovereign decree of God, well then things start to, then we can understand that they can say in the Talmud, uh, oh you can have sex with a three, three year old girl that's in one day, you know, I mean, yeah. that, uh, you can understand all that crazy stuff we were reading in the Talmud because yeah. they've been given over to a reprobate mind. There's a part of us that don't want to believe that it can be this bad. Yes, but it there's, is this bad. But it is this bad. Yeah, this and, bad, yeah. and that's another nice thing about this particular yeah. video we're doing now. It's a reality check yeah. <laughs> uh, and, for and a you, lot of people, I think. And it's just, the fields are ripe. Where are the workers? I yes. mean, uh, in a way, you can kind of feel guilty that you're not out there more often mm -hmm. just talking with people about the gospel and right. explaining to them the New and Old Testament. Because if it's really this bad, we're just in a sea of mess. That's right. We are. Well, I sort of sometimes feel like Noah. You know, he was out there preaching for 120 years. Yeah. And how many people believed him during that time? <laughs> Just if they did, they died before the flood. <laughs> <laughs> All yeah. right, so anyway, that explains why they have a very, uh, the Jews have a very limited knowledge of Scripture, just like most people. Right. Okay, myth number two here. I can just invite my Jewish friend to my church. In fact, many Jewish people might be hesitant to attend church. 
There is no substitute for you personally sharing your faith. Yeah. That's the key here. Uh, and the faith, right. Uh, myth. I may not be able to answer their questions. Fact. That's true. But it does not change the truth of the gospel. Tell your friend you are happy to research the information. This gives you an opportunity to have further witnessing opportunities too. Right. Myth. I need to wait for the Holy Spirit's leading. I don't want to lose my friendship. Fact. God has already told us we are to be as witnesses. Matthew chapter 28, 19 and 20. Go into all the world, preach mm-hmm. the gospel, uh, and so forth. If you are friendly and forthright, you will gain your friend's respect for genuinely caring even if they don't agree to discuss the matter at length. Mm -hmm. Myth. I will let my life be a testimony and wait until they ask me about Jesus. Fact. That will likely be a long wait. (laughs) Most Jewish people... Like never. (laughs) There you go. Most Jewish people feel that religion is a private matter and might be uncomfortable asking. Besides, the Great Commission commands us to go tell. Okay, so then we have practical tips. When witnessing to a Jewish person, remember, make friends. Demonstrate that you really care about the person. Affirm the fact that you know they are Jewish and that you appreciate their Jewishness. Let your friendship serve as the foundation for your witness to them. Be upfront. Declare yourself a follower of Jesus right away. You do not want to appear deceptive or coercive. Be yourself. Ask questions. Everyone likes to be asked their opinion. This can be a good way to steer the conversation towards spiritual matters. Questions about Israel, an upcoming Jewish holiday, or even a Bible question about the Old Testament are good places to start. Give a personal testimony. The reality of God in your life is a powerful witness. Many Jewish people think that you were born a Christian in the same way that they were born Jewish. Hearing how you became a follower of Jesus, how God answers your prayers, can provoke your Jewish friend to jealousy. Romans chapter 11, verse 11. Use scripture. Don't be afraid to answer questions with a verse from the Bible. Encourage your Jewish friend to read the New Testament. Most Jewish people have never read the New Testament, and most Jews who have come to faith in Christ, came as a result of reading the New Testament. After all, it is a very Jewish book, (laughs) particularly Hebrews. But anyway, be prayerfully persistent. Don't be put off if you receive a negative reaction at first. In fact, you should expect it. Keep looking for opportunities. Keep praying. Seek to introduce your friend to a Jewish believer. Declare to the Jewish people the vital and eternal consequence of believing on the Jewish Messiah, Jesus Christ. Our Savior was incarnate as a Hebrew man. He was called Yeshua HaMashiach by his disciples. The Apostle Paul said in Acts 17, 30 and 31, God now commandeth all men everywhere to repent because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. Wherefore he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. John 3, 17 through 21 says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. You know, Rob, when I... I found that when you read the book of Acts, you find that the apostles have a way of preaching the word of God mm-hmm. in their it's all evangelism. Mm-hmm. Basically, when you're looking at Paul and Barnabas and, mm-hmm. and the other disciples and, and apostles, they're going out and they're preaching the word. You find that that they center on two main things. One, the prophecies of the Old Testament of the coming Messiah and how Jesus fulfilled those prophecies. Mm-hmm. And the other main evangelistic the enterprise they engaged in is 
arguing for the resurrection Reckon, of Christ yeah. from the dead. So those are your two main guns yes. when you're preaching the gospel and evangelizing mm -hmm. to the lost. Yeah. So these messianic prophecies really play a big part in proving the, the true identity of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So this chart here that the people can see at home on their screen shows important messianic passages. It shows the Old Testament prophecy like we see here, Messiah to be the seed of a woman. That's mm -hmm. in Genesis 3.15 and it's fulfilled in the New Testament in Galatians 4.4. 4. The Messiah to be the seed of Abraham, Genesis 12.3, 18.18. 18. But in the New Testament we see it's fulfilled in Jesus in the passages found in Luke 3, 23 and 34, and also Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. And I could go on and on, but I'm not going to read all these, but right. you can freeze frame your screen right. and see all these important Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah, and then the New Testament showing how Jesus fulfilled right. all those prophecies. Good stuff. Oh yeah, and that's, a, that's part of the key to evangelism. Mm -hmm. Uh, with this, uh, Rob, I'd like to turn the floor back over to you to conclude the show. I would like you to assume for a minute that there are, are Christians, of course, watching, which that'll definitely be the case, but what they can do, besides what I just said here, but also if there's any Jewish people watching this, out of curiosity, obviously they'd have to be watching this show out of curiosity of nothing else. What would you say to them uh, at this moment if Assuming there's some Jewish people watching, and then anything else you might want to say to Christians. Go ahead. Well, I'd like to say to Christians, carry the gospel into the Jewish community because they have been inundated in many cases with an overwhelming amount of instruction from their rich history and background and everything that the Talmud has said. I'm pretty certain that most Jewish people today have not read much of the Talmud or have not been taught much of it, but it's there. It's part of your heritage and it continues to be built upon, even with this new translation and new commentary on it. And so I would say that uh, Christians have an opportunity and a responsibility to share the gospel with this community, which has been steeped in some sense in Old Testament Law, Old Testament prophecy, Old Testament Psalms, Proverbs, wisdom, but they've never been able to put the pieces together. And maybe they've been overwhelmed with the commentaries that mm. are made on Talmud. Mishnah yeah. and the so-called oral tradition, which is just absolutely overwhelming. Uh, we don't believe that uh, God gave Moses this superior oral tradition which has been handed down and enlarged over the years. We believe that enough has been given by God in the written words of the Old Testament. Which Jesus testified to. Which he testified to. He didn't testify to. all this oral tradition. No. He testified to the real he word of God. He quoted the Old Testament as written and exactly. referred to the Old Testament it is as written. written. Thus says the word. And uh, as far as the Jewish community is concerned, it's hard to know where you stand when it comes to the three categories of Judaism that we have discussed. But all three of them are the antithesis of biblical Christianity. And I think you know that. I think you've probably been raised to understand at least that, that your religion stands in opposition to Christianity. But we would ask you to take a closer look at the Old Testament and the prophecies of a Messiah and the fulfillment of those prophecies as written in the New Testament. And all we can do is ask you to take a look. And if you know of a Christian, sit down, talk. Talk about the Old Testament. Talk about Moses. Talk about David. Talk about the great number of Old Testament figures that mean so much to us as Christians. Talk about the prophets. Talk about Isaiah and all the major and minor prophets. And maybe, just maybe, you begin to understand why we Christians truly believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the one promised, the one and only Messiah, the Son of God, who's come to seek and to save the lost, and by his atoning death has turned the wrath of God away from sinners like me, 
like Larry, and all those who have come to Christ in need of the one and only Savior. So have a look, and uh, I hope the information we presented to you, although somewhat of a barrage, will be of some help, at least spur you to do further research in these matters. Thank you so much, brother, for that. Uh, I want to thank our viewers that hung on with us till the end of this program. You know, sometimes when you do YouTube, you know there's some people that only have a 10-minute attention span, right. others have longer. Then do it and, 10 minutes at a time. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, if you made it this far into the show, I, I congratulate you and thank you for that because it means you're serious about really uh, finding out more about this information and uh, perhaps utilizing it in your life to help others. Well, with that, I want to sign off for Rob Zins and myself. I'm Larry Wessels with Christian Answers. I want to thank you for being with us. Join us again next time for another episode. And remember this, John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He fulfilled all those Old Testament prophecies. Historical records actually back this up too from non-biblical sources and things of that nature. I, that's a whole other show right there, but I'm not going to get into all that. Uh, but uh, anyway, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Believe on him, and thou shalt be saved. Acts 16, 30, 31. God bless. Bye-bye. If you like our YouTube channel, please subscribe by clicking on the subscribe button and then by also clicking the bell above to get an automatic update whenever we produce another YouTube video for our See Answers TV channel. Please share our videos with your friends and relatives. May God bless you. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what is done for Christ will last. See related videos by tapping or clicking screens.